Find out from Ray Blakeney how to start a business and discover what life is like in Querétaro, Mexico in this video interview with expats in Mexico. So you've always been interested in being an uh, entrepreneur uh, since the time that uh, you were in Silicon Valley for that year uh, between junior and senior year in college. That's right. Um, the only thing that I was missing before I met my wife was I had the skill sets to put up and sell a product online. I knew how to do that. I just didn't know what the product, I mean, I was not, you know, a programmer is not the product. I just didn't know what to sell online. Meeting my wife and she, her degree is in English and Spanish education. So she's a teacher. Um, so that was the obvious, the obvious first step. She was our first teacher at Live Lingua. So initially, the first version or first iteration of the page was simply a website, you know, selling language classes with her. But then it grew so quickly, we started having to hire other staff on and other teachers. And she's now moved into the role of academic director or, or in a more traditional sense in a company, she'd be kind of the COO. She takes care of the day-to-day -day operations, the hiring, you know, the she runs the customer support people, um, the team. We have a team lead there, but she kind of, you know, if they have a problem, they go to her first before coming to me. Um, so she's kind of the CEO of the of Live Lingua right now. Um, and with your skill set, you basically built the uh, site uh, yourself, I'm sure, right? Exactly. Exactly. We've been, we've been very lucky in that sense. That and that's the reason why we now have multiple businesses. If you're not a program, it does it doesn't cost me any money to build a business. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I can think of the idea, and then I just spend two or three months developing the minimum viable product, and I throw throw it up. And my other skill set is online marketing. Those are my programming and online marketing are my specialties. So mm -hmm. we go out there and. See if it sticks. If it doesn't, it hadn't cost us anything. It just simply took some time. How does uh, uh, Live Lingua work for uh, consumers? Sure. Um, the the model is pretty simple. You can come in there. We offer 11 languages, the 11 most widely spoken languages in the world. Um, and the classes are with native teachers. So, you know, a native French speaker, native English speaker, native Japanese speaker, whatever it is. Though in most cases, they're not actually in their home countries, which is one way we pass the savings on to the customers. Um, for example, it's much easier. We can pay what's a great salary. For example, one of our French teachers is in Guatemala. We pay an incredible salary for Guatemala. I mean, much more than he would make working at a Guatemalan language school. Um, but it's still less than we would have to pay somebody living in downtown Paris. So, you know, we kind of split the differences. And so it's able to, these teachers are able to get a really good great lifestyle. You know, they have kids, families, and in most cases, they've married somebody from these countries. Um, and we're able to pass the savings on to the students. What happens is they come into the website and we offer a free trial. So you kind of go up there, you sign up. Uh, we pair you up with a class coordinator, which is one of the things that makes Live Lingua unique as opposed to other sites, which are more like directories where you kind of are, you're on your own. You go and find your own teacher. You contact them. You try to set up a class. They may or may not show up. If they don't show up, you're on your own again because you have to go to somebody else. Here you have a class coordinator where you tell them all your needs, your goals, your background, and based on that, they help pair you up with one of our teachers because this person works has worked for years with these teachers. So they know much better than even their profiles would say. Some teachers are simply better at writing nicer profiles um, than others. Once you have the trial class, then you can decide how many hours you'd like to sign up for. You can sign up for as little as one hour at a time. If you're still not sure, you just sign up for one hour at a time. Or if you want to get a cheaper price, because the more you buy, the kind of cheaper each hour gets, um, you can buy up to 50 hours, and that would give you, depending on the language, up to 30 or 40% off per hour um, on those classes. And we've had students now with us for many years. We work with schools. We do. We have contracts with some government organizations in the US. Um, Ranging from the State Department, Inter America Development Bank, we've worked. We've worked with companies like Coca Cola. We did some training with McDonald's and Walgreens in the past. So we're primarily one on one is what we do. But we do have a few corporate clients usually coming in through recommendations. Those corporate clients, because somebody had a good experience, they recommend it to somebody in the HR department of another company, and then we kind of get in that way. For now, them. when you started your business, did you form a corporation? Not when we started, but we have since then. Um, when we started, it was just a sole proprietorship, and but now it's an we're an S corp um, registered in the United States simply for well, for trust reasons. Number one, because again, if people 
are sending paying via credit card online, it's much better to see Boston, where it's where registered Boston on your credit card bill than Querétaro, Mexico, which looks like somebody hacked into your system and you have no idea why your money is going to Mexico. Um, and secondly, because that, uh, that opens up personally for my wife and I access to 401ks and everything in the United States. Can't put money into it unless I actually report income. So all your financials basically are in the U.S.? Correct. You pay Correct. U.S. taxes and, and Mexican taxes? Only U.S. taxes, since we have no real, as far as the Mexican government's concerned, I have no income in Mexico. I see. So if uh, someone in Mexico lived in uh, Cancun, for example, and wanted to use your service, if that person is in Cancun, would is that still viewed as a, as a global customer? Exactly. Because that, what, when they pay online, it goes straight into Boston. It doesn't come to oh, us I here. Oh, I see. Okay. It so it's, it's where the money is received, where the corporation exactly. is received. I exactly. Exactly. So. I got you. Okay, great. So how do you like uh, Querétaro? You've been there for, what, eight years now? Eight years. Yeah, almost exactly. Um, to the day we've been living. We love it. It's a very livable city, which I know is not a very glamorous answer, but it's the truth. Um, you know, when people come and visit me, they ask me, so what tourist sites are there to see? Our house here that you're looking at is a renovated, you know, where the, it's like many cities in Mexico, UNESCO World Heritage Site. So we couldn't change the facade, but we renovated the inside. It's 400 years old. We have a view of an aqueduct. There is a small Otomi ruin outside with a interesting has an hacienda on top because they didn't know it was a ruin for many years. So they built an hacienda on top. How and interesting. Then, so they, then they realized that the hacienda was 200 years old, which is UNESCO said was a heritage site. Then they dug up the hill and realized it was a 2,000 year old pyramid under it. <laughs> so they couldn't destroy either one of them. So now there's an hacienda sitting on top of an old pyramid. But it's just a one pyramid in the middle of nowhere. So it's not really like a huge tourist attraction. But it's always been one of the safest cities in Mexico. You, the statistics between us and Merida seem to be kind of, Querétaro and Merida seem to kind of compete for that top spot every year. Why do you think that is? Now, the official answer is one because it's also one of the richest states and cities in Canada, in Mexico as well. The average income here is around thirty-four thousand dollars U.S., while the average across Mexico is around eleven or twelve thousand. So that kind of shows you the discrepancy. I've seen more BMWs and Mercedes driving up and down the streets here than on most places in the United States. So there must be a lot of expats living there. Not really, because most people have never heard of this place before, um, no, and most people who have heard of it can't pronounce it, so it might make it a little more difficult. But. Um, <laughs> The expat, there's two expat communities, and I think most major cities have these. There's the expats who choose to live here, which most of us live here downtown. Um, you know, they're the ones who learn Spanish and want to interact with the Mexicans and all that. Then they're the two expats who are here because they were sent here by their companies. Because Bombardier has their base here. It's a big aeronautical center. Um, there's a Ford plant. There's a Samsung plant. Um, so we have a lot of Koreans. We have a lot of Japanese uh, that, in, in the city as well. They're the ones who are here, but not by choice. And obviously, they usually don't even bother to learn Spanish. Uh, they eat at their rest. Our, one of our favorite restaurants is a Korean restaurant. And I joke that my wife is the only non-Asian in there when we go to eat on Friday nights. Because everybody else is Korean. I'm half Filipino, so I kind of count. And then her. So she's like the only non-Asian in the entire restaurant. Because they only go there every single after work every night. Um, and... Those two groups, while they interact a little bit, they're kind of they live in very separate places. There is a a suburb which is kind of the expat suburb, right? Which is kind of looks more like the U.S. If anything, lawns, but it's a gated community. Um, and then the rest of us who live among the Mexicans, primarily here downtown, but in other areas as well. So you have the integrated expats, and then you have the uh, corporate transferees who live in the expat exactly. bubble. Exactly. The ex that's, ex that's exactly it. That's very, very typical. So I didn't uh, realize that uh, Querétaro was such a uh, large um, manufacturing center. Yeah, it's it's uh, again. It's I think it's the reason why it is the second richest um, city, second or third richest city per capita um, in Mexico. Mexico City beats it out brute force, but that's because you have twenty million people there, and even if everybody there makes a thousand dollars a year, that's a huge, you know. Yeah. Huge amount you can produce. But here, the average income is 30000 highly educated. A lot of people people are complaining because it's grown in 20 years from about 150000 to $1.5 million. And even in the time I've been here in eight years, it's gone from about 800000 to $1.5 million. That's, so it's grown very, very that's quickly. That's enormous growth. So the economy is really strong there. It is extremely strong. And companies are opening up. They're doing a lot of what they do in the U.S., but they don't do so much here in Mexico yet, which is by offering these huge tax breaks to these international companies that come in. And since... 
we're in the Bajillo, so the kind of the plateau area. And while there are mountains nearby, our area is generally flat. There's a lot of land for these industries to put their factories on. Sure. And the weather is it barely, you know, it's arid for the most part, like Arizona. So it doesn't rain very much, about 85 degrees year round. Uh, and that for a lot of industries, that's actually a really nice Mm-hmm. benefit right because they don't have to worry about it running the air conditioner because it doesn't get that hot it doesn't get that cold that they need to do heating um the dry air helps a lot with electronic devices that they're producing so they don't have to worry about humidity getting into mm-hmm. their mechanical devices right. so i think it's a very and we're they have an international airport now so we we have flights to houston chicago miami so you don't have to go to leon any longer yeah, no, no. And usually airport. if we do go anywhere, we go to Mexico City. It's a two and a half hour bus ride from Mexico City and they have buses directly to the airport terminal. So my wife and I just get on, a, you know, those great Mexican buses, Primera Plus with a plasma screen oh, they're TV. Great. They're fantastic. Yeah. 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 Everybody thinks Greyhound when my friends come from the U.S. Oh, we're going to take a bus. I'm like, no, you don't know what it is. Yeah, exactly. You know, no, it's not Greyhound at all, right? Exactly. Now, um, what's the cost of living like there? It's higher than... As a result, it's probably higher than a lot of other places in Mexico, but still, I would say at least, depending on how you live, of course, but you could easily live on about 40 to 50% less than the United States, and that's comfortable living. I mean, that's, you know, having a maid come. My wife and I go to the farmer's market, which is organic. There's an organic farmer's market every Saturday, and we go shopping there. Um, the Costco, Sam's Clubs nearby. Um, yeah, uh, so, you know, if you made $2,000, two or $3,000 a month, two thousand dollars a month let's say you would live very comfortably here any more than that you would yeah now do you rent your home or did you buy your no home? we own this we when we sold our for last business we were able to take some of that money and okay buy the house how so much did, how much did you pay for your house our house is probably not a very good the thing is we knew the owner he got cancer survived and and recovered but then he didn't want his kids fighting over a house so he decided to sell it to us at are you familiar with, you know, Mexican property taxes are pretty much nothing. Right. I mean, you live exactly. in California. You yeah. know, you yeah. probably, yeah, you pay more in a year than a decade or whatever here in sure. Mexico. And the reason for that is, is because they have some aval come here, come to the house and they say, okay, this house is worth about this much, but it's got really nothing to do with the actual value of the house. It's usually 10% of what the actual value of the house was. Um, so this guy liked us. So he made the aval come, look at the value of the house and he sold it to us for that price. So we bought our house for about $45,000. Um, and then we wow. put another, we put another 60 into it, um, for renovating. We hired an architect. It's probably worth about 250 right now. Um, we finished about two or three years ago. So, and how large is the home? It's not too big, but 1500 square feet. 1500. I mean, it's not, and it's yeah, a it's couple of a, bedrooms and a couple of bathrooms. Three bedrooms, 1.5 bath and an office where I'm sitting right now. Um, and, and it's close to downtown. We're two blocks away from the main plaza, one block away from the market. We don't own a car. We have Kenneth as Uber. So, you know, if I never need to get anywhere. By the way, I, would you recommend uh, uh, expats uh, have cars down there? Depends on where you live. Again, Chapala it might be a little bit more because you need to go into Guadalajara every once in a while to kind of get certain goods. Um, I think the nearest Costco is 45 minutes drive down um, the highway. And even longer, if depending on if you're kind of on a more distant part of the lake, right? I'm assuming you're in Ajijik or like sure, right sure, in the Sure, 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 yeah. um, sure. Although, although taxis are very inexpensive and uh, and, exactly. and, and buses go everywhere. So yeah, I mean, you, you, you can, I'm sure plenty of people do over there, make do without a car. In our city, there's absolutely no reason for one. I mean, literally, I mean, we have Uber and Uber costs about $3 to get anywhere. Um, $5 to get out to my mother-in-law, but she lives in like in a far off suburb. Um, so why would I ever need a car? And Uber is ubiquitous in our city. Again, it's a wealthy city, so everybody has a cell phone and everybody's using Uber, much to the chagrin of the taxi drivers, of course, because they're not doing very well as a result of it. Um, and I run a website for a car rental company, so I actually get two weeks of free car rental. They don't pay me, but I don't bill them, and they give me two weeks of free car rental a year. Nice. It pretty much covers any time I need a car. I just call them on the phone. They deliver it to my house like Enterprise in the U.S., and – then they pick it up when I'm done, so I don't have to worry about that either. What are the top three things you love about living in Mexico and uh, Querétaro? Well, cost of living is one of the top things, just simply because we're lucky in the sense that we make US business as well, and you know we'd be living comfortably in the U.S., but that same amount in Mexico, we live on about 10 to 20 percent of what we make. I mean, it's and we we have a maid, we have a dog walker, we you know it's not. 
Uh, we're like, we don't have a mortgage. We have no car payments. We have no debt. Zero. If it wasn't other than food and gas, you know, electricity, we have no bills every single month. Um, you don't even need health insurance in Mexico, even though we do pay for that just in case. But the out of pocket is fairly. Uh, it's very low. Yeah, it's yeah. it's catastrophic insurance more than anything else, sure, right? Sure. I, yeah. huge, I think the copay is like three thousand dollars. So right. if you know anything less than that, we're on our own. But we've never needed it anyway. Right. Um, so the cost is one of the reasons. I like. In a lot of ways, to me, it feels a lot like Turkey. If you replace all the mosques with churches, it kind of culturally to me, it really was not that big of a change. And you know this from Turkey, doner kebab and tacos al pastor, you just change one from lamb to pork and you pretty much, have, you know, it looks exactly the same. I mean, it's, I'm sure they have the same base history behind them. So I felt very comfortable when I moved here kind of culturally, the whole, how close people are to their families. You know, something that in the United States we're losing a lot. We're much more of an individualistic society up there. Um, which has its benefits as well. I mean, if, especially for innovation and all of that, it's much better for, for that. Here in Mexico, they're much more sticking to the status quo. But I actually like that, you know, I know all of my wife's family, I, but more than I know my family. I mean, I barely, in the US, I, they're in Boston, Toronto, Indiana. I mean, you know, I've seen them once every 10, 15 years if I'm lucky. So I really like that that part of the culture. So, co so cost of living and family, what would be your third uh, favorite thing? The weather. Um, while I do miss snow sometimes, you know, I get over it after going you to do? the U.S. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For about a week. It's it's nice to choose when you get to see the snow, right? You go yeah. for a week or two for skiing, then you come back. It's 85 degrees year-round here. I mean, never too hot, never too cold. We have one month where it's cold by Mexican standards uh -huh. and one month where it's hot. But we don't, you know, have a heater or an air conditioner. You just kind of turn on the fan and one of the things, and you put on sweaters for the other one. Um, so you kind of – I love the weather, you, you know. Well, it, it sounds like an absolutely great place to live. In fact, we do not have it in our profiles on expatsinmexico.com. But uh, it's one of the cities that we'll be adding within the next year or so because it just is such an attractive place to live for expats. It is. I, you know, I think if I talk to most of my expats friends, they might try to convince you not to because one of the things we like is one of those hidden gems. You know, oh, that, sure. You know, San Miguel is nearby, so about 45 minutes away. Right. But everybody here, all the Mexicans here call it Gringo Land, right? That's what they call I'm going sure. to Gringo Land this weekend. Great restaurants, beautiful city. Right. Um, but just due to the large influx of foreigners, the kind of culture gets lost a little bit there. Sure. We actually have the same amount of foreigners here, even though it's more diverse than American. You know, we have a lot of Japanese now. Mm -hmm. um, Tata Group has opened a consulting firm here, so we have a lot of Indians moving in now, mm -hmm. Chinese industry, all of that. Mm -hmm. But the city is 1.5 million people. So even if you have 20, 30, 40,000 expats living here, that's a drop in the bucket. It doesn't sure. change the kind of fabric of the sure, city. Sure, sure, sure. So. so much more international. Exactly, exactly. And hey. the convenience of Mexico City is great. I mean, we can literally be in Mexico City in two and a half hours if we want anything. Nice, I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Ray, I really enjoyed our conversation today. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Hopefully, it's useful.